I'm Deborah Miller, obviously, I think. Um, what we're doing is talking about the patient involvement with FDA. And I think you've heard this from Richard when he was here uh, speaking earlier that before 1988, that FDA had a very paternalistic view in terms of uh, balancing risks and benefits of poten potential risks and benefits of drugs that they felt they knew better than patients and advocacy groups, or, or I don't know how many advocacy groups were really around at that time, probably quite a few. Um, but anyway, um, and then the advocates, actu uh, the activist actually showed up at FDA, the HIV AIDS advocates and patients, and said, well, you know, you, we think that we have something to say, and maybe you don't know everything that we feel, that you're, you're, you're talking for us. Let us speak for ourselves. And so that's, you know, FDA responded by, cre you know, creating different ways to speed up the review time and access to promising therapies without jeopardizing patient safety or compromising the scientific rigor. And it created our office. And I believe that Richard was there from, very, from basically the very beginning. It was not called the Office of Health and Constituent Affairs. It, we've gone through many different names. But that's what happens at federal agencies. Um, OCA, the Office of Health and Constituent Affairs, we work with patients and patient advocates, and we encourage and support their active participation with FDA. So basically what we see is that the bridge is OCA. So you have your review divisions, and they're pretty overwhelmed as it is, and, and don't have enough people as it is to do the work that they do. You know, we now had, at that time, you had all these patient groups coming in, especially the, like I said, initially the HIV AIDS patient groups, and they wanted to be heard. So how could that message get to the review divisions when they don't have the time to do their own work, much less to meet with them, the patients? And so they created our office as a way it was a it was a mechanism that patients could come in sit and talk to people discuss their concerns it also gave fda a way to work with them to educate them on the fda processes policies and procedures and why fda does what it does so it was a mutual learning curve between um fd between oca and the patient patients and patient advocacy groups, and then OCA turns around and can take that information to the divisions and let them know what the concerns are. Here's just a, a brief little cartoon or graphic about patient participation milestones at FDA. Um, as I just said, the HIV AIDS advocacy started in 1988. In 1991, was the first time that we had a patient rep sit on an antiviral or any advisory committee panel. Uh, it turned out to be quite successful, so it was expanded to include cancer, eventually neurology, and then finally it was, it was deemed to be so successful that they, all the divisions um, with drugs and biologics they start to include a patient rep on those advisory committee panels. Um, in 1996, at least with CEDAR and CBER, the drugs and biologics, the patient rep sitting on the panels got a voting had voting privileges. Um, although I have to put a little plug in here, um, I'm not sure how aware everyone is. The last ODAC meeting that was had would, made a little bit of history because uh, Dr. Rick Pazder, the director of oncology products, had decided there would be no questions at the end. And so there would be no vote because his argument has always been when we convene an advisory committee panel, we're not so interested in the vote. We want to hear 
what you have to say. We're bringing you experts in because you work with these patients, you've used this drug, you've got the experience. We want to hear the, you know, what your thought processes are about a specific issue. So we'll see what happens. And I heard there was a, another recent advisory committee that eliminated the questions as well. Because I think sometimes when you have the questions and you put forward a vote, people think, oh, then that's, that's a given, and it's not. It's just a recommendation. So then in 2001, we had expanded the role of the patient representative to include divisional consults. And that meant that there were different times in the drug approval process where the divisions, when they knew there was an upcoming meeting and it was on a topic that would be related to, a, to the patients directly and felt that they could get input, that they could invite a patient consultant who would be one of our representatives to participate, to sit in, they would get the data in advance that would be discussed, and to actually participate and, and join those conversations. Um, I had a couple, I had added a couple other things that weren't on this slide, and I apologize. Um, in 2006, the office what we did for patients, we started doing for healthcare providers. So we started the, we established the Health Professional Liaison Program. Then what it, and it made sense, once we did that, it was decided, well, you know, maybe we should bring the MedWatch program over into that office too, because you, what does the MedWatch program do? It, it takes in information about adverse events from patients and healthcare providers, and then it pushes that information out through MedWatch Alert. So it really made kind of sense for that, that particular um, program to come over. And then in 2011, we created the patient network. And Steve's actually going to go into more detail about the network. It was basically created because we do a lot of training of our patient reps. We do webinars, et cetera, which I'm going to talk about. But we realized that the patients and other advocates who are not patient advocates for FDA need to know that same information. And so we created that website so that everyone could go and get the same information that we're given to patient reps. Because we heard that too. People, I remember I, I met someone who was uh, working with one of the organizations and she, you know, and I said, you know, we're thinking about a webinar coming up and what do you think about topics? And she said, and she's someone who could not become a patient rep. So she said, I want to know what you're teaching the patient reps. That's what I want to know, because that's what I need to know to be a good advocate. So then um, I think we've, we've heard quite a bit about Fidufa and Fidesia, so I won't go into to that. So basically, this is like an outline of what I sort of went over in the history we have. Uh, we, the office represents the patient and the healthcare professional concerns. First, we have the patient liaison program, and the first thing we do is we manage the patient representative program, which I'll go into a little bit more later. The second is that we work with review divisions. I know it's, it, it's kind of under the patient rep program. I apologize, I somehow um, moved that margin over. Uh, the, sec the third area that we have responsibilities over is to respond to emails and phone calls. And we take all kinds, you know, we're always asked all kinds of information. And I'm trying to find my notes because I, I, I think it's kind of interesting to hear what sometimes the, the phone calls come in about. We get lots of questions, you know, about side effects of approved drugs and, uh, and biologics and devices. And we get questions about clinical trials and expanded access programs. We do get food questions. And I've even gotten requests for information to bring in an expanded access use. For, uh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm, th I'm jumping ahead. Food questions, and, and the food questions are usually, I drank half of a bottle of something and then found a glob of something on the bottom of the bottle. What should I do? And so 
you know, we, I tell them what they need to do. And then I, that, this, this is where I was jumping ahead. We also do get questions on animals, and that's where I remember one time we've even gotten requests for expanded access to a medication for an animal, which really surprised me. It was new, and I had to call over CBM, Center for Veterinary Medicine, and I said, do you do this? And they said, yeah, we do it. And so it, it's, it's, every day is a learning experience for me. And then we get calls that are really, really interesting because, you know, it's, it's people want to give us advice on how we should be running the agency. Um, the really, really interesting phone calls are the ones where they want to tell us how we should be interpreting the code of federal regulations. It's, it, 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 I see it as an opportunity, a learning experience, an opportunity to educate them about what we do, why we do what we do, and what we can and we can't do. Um, and then, of course, you know, information. That, and, and people mean well. They call and say, well, I want to tell you about this product I took. I no longer have cancer, so it must have been a cure. And, and that's something else that we do in the office a lot is to just listen to patients. Because sometimes they call with those kinds of comments, but they call also just they want to be heard, they, they're upset or whatever, and they get someone who listens, or the family member. And I can say from personal experience that, you know, there's lots of help out there for, for patients, but the family member, it's not true. And so when the family member's calling about their patient, their loved one, for a, you know, maybe expanded access. And then, you know, when we get on the phone and say, well, how are you doing? It really opens up a box, you know, where, oh my gosh, you know, so we're, we're sort of counselors too. So let's see. That's good. And then the last one is the patient network, like I said, that Steve's going to talk about. So um, the other side of OCA is managing the health professional liaison program. And the only thing I'm going to really talk about here is MedWatch. And I really do, I know that Richard touched on it, and I think somebody else, I really do want to encourage people, you need to use the MedWatch program. It's mandatory for industry. It is voluntary reporting of event, adverse events for uh, physicians and for patients. But we get, I, I can't remember if it was a program or a research project done on MedWatch or, or something, but I remember reading that we get more information from patients than we do from physicians. A, physicians are really busy. You know, you may tell them you had a side effect. They may get around to reporting it. They may not. But they also do some filtering. So you or your patients may say, I had this experience, and I, I know this was from the drug. And the physician sometimes sits there and says, I don't think that was from the drug. I'm not reporting that. So we actually find that we get more complete forms from the patients. And that's important. We need to know all that information. And we had a big project a couple years ago. The, you can go to this website that's listed. The form is now online. Very easy. Push a button, goes through. Please, please, please tell your patients, they have any adverse events over pro uh, any medical product, please report it. Here's a picture of some of our patient reps from one of our previous meetings. Um, I think it was from 2014, is that, yeah, or 13, I can't remember now. Here's a list of our patient representative area, the areas that they serve in. Um, we currently have, I'm sorry, i got to check my notes because I'm not very good with these numbers, about 196 patient reps, I think, that I looked yesterday before I came. It's always changing. And the interesting part is that, the, about, as you heard from my bio, I, I'm in the oncology area. About 86 of those are patient reps for oncology. And um, it's really interesting. This list keeps growing because we have more and more rare diseases and that you have patients who, and family members who want to re represent that particular rare disease because it's unique, to, you know, for that person. Um, as far as cancers are concerned, there's talk that eventually they're all going to be considered rare diseases. You know, I, in the beginning, I would get three or four patients who were my leukemia and lymphoma patient reps. Now I have to get CML, AML, 
Hodgkin's, non-Hodgkin's, adults, children, you know, parents of children. It, it, it's getting so specific. Um, and it's going to get, I think the change is, e is even going to be different in the future with precision medicine because in, especially in oncology, we're finding that the mutations are sometimes the driving factor for treatments. And anyway, I, I, I could go on and on about that. But anyway, so it, it's a changing field, but we, we keep getting more and more patient reps for that reason. Um, what are the criteria for being considered for the patient rep program? The very first one is personal experience with the disease. We like patients. The review divisions like patients. They want to, the patients experience the disease, they want to hear it from them. Only if the patient can't be there, whether they, or they're too sick, or if it's a child, then we have a primary caregiver. We'll go to that. And actually recently, and I know Steve's going to talk a little bit about this, we actually had a case. It wasn't a patient rep program, but we brought in a group of children to get their perspective on a disease. And I think that that may or may not, but I think it may be a sign of what's going to come in the future. So I know that, I think it, it's in Europe, they, they do have some, they have more activity with children, and so this may be um, pushing the U.S. to do the same, and I think it's great. And I know Steve had a really positive experience, and he'll tell you a little bit more about that. We also want patient reps who are into the community. They know what, I mean, surely they're there to talk about their own, they know about their own experience, but they're representing the community. So they have to come on, they have to keep in touch with that community, know what the concerns are so that they can speak on them at these advisory committee meetings or the divisional meetings. We need someone who is analytical and objective, but you know you don't need to be a scientist, but you got to be able to understand complex issues and, and make some decisions. Um, and then, of course, the conflict of interest, which is always an issue. We, we, we need minimal or no conflict of interest. So how do we prepare patient reps for the roles? We do one-on-one -on -one orientation, and I call it FDA 101 training by OCA staff. And then we have an annual workshop, and I call it FDA 102, and it just goes further into detail about what we do, um, such as the topics that are listed, the role of the advisory committees, et cetera. And then we also have continuing education, because there's often changes that we have to make clear to these patient reps, things that have happened either through policy changes or, or uh, changes in the the research field itself. So we have these continuing education opportunities that we tell them we really want them to tune into. Um, I, this is kind of my opinion. I think I see that the patient rep has three roles. One, the traditional role, which is to serve as panel member on the advisory committee the committees. And as voting members for the drugs and biologic committees, non-voting member for the medical devices. We'll get there eventually. Number two, patient consultant. And that's where you we bring in the patient reps as consultants on the divisional meetings. The last one is, I think, is really important because we've done it, we've used patient reps so many times, and that is as an informal consultant. You have uh, patient reps who, you know, they keep us informed. Many times they'll call and say, hey, I was at a meeting the other night, this is an issue, and I think you need to take that information back to the division, or there's also times when I've kind of heard of something or thought of something and I, I need some input, so I'll call someone from one of the organizations and talk to them and say, have you heard anything about this? Should we be concerned? What's going on? This is a, a little graphic to talk about where patient input can come in. Uh, at the blue translational area is actually where a patient can work with the sponsor, the drug sponsor, to give input. And then at FDA, there's these meetings pre-IND, phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. There's these meetings all along the way where we can take a patient rep and, and use them as consults. And then even uh, post-marketing as well. And then, of course, the traditional role for the patient rep would be with the advisory committee panel when you're actually looking at an NDA or BLA for approval. So... What do patient 
reps bring to the table to FDA. First of all, the pro their product user perspective. They, they use the products, they know how it's benefiting them, what changes need to be done, et cetera. Their point of view on risk and benefit, and you've heard quite a bit about that, so I won't go into detail there. Quality of life and other patient reported outcomes for labeling, that's really important, and we, we really want to try to get more involvement there. Contribution to better designed future clinical trials, and, and that's important. You know, sometimes you, when the companies are are creating these clinical trials, it really would help to have a patient rep sitting there saying, you know, you, you, you do better if you look for this group or go here or this should be the design or the, that endpoint's not so great. Or I mean, they, it, the patient reps are just so educated these days. They come in with such great ideas that things, topics that we don't think about, issues that we may not, you know, con be concerned about. And then inclusion of women and ethnic other ethnic groups, um, you've heard from Susan Wood, of course. And then what's also great is that FDA gets community ambassadors and educators because what they do is what we teach them and train them about and work with them about, they go back out into the community, not with the proprietary information, but the FDA information, and they go back and they train or talk to their folks to say, well, you know, yeah, FDA did that, but this is why they did it. And it really was for our benefit. They really do have, you know, our best interest in mind. So anyway, that concludes my study and now, or my presentation, and now Steve is going to talk. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'm going to talk uh, very briefly because I don't want to stand between lunch and um, the next pre presenter. But as everybody was saying, we did create the patient network in order to fill a gap for an advocate who's not necessarily associated with an organization or who's just starting to learn about their disease and how to present. So the patient network on the FDA site was actually created one year ago today. Prior to that, we were on an independent site, um, not we were just kind of getting our feet wet. So we moved over to the FDA site about one, actually, yeah, 2016. Uh, sorry, 14. Um, so what is the patient network? As people have said, it was a scale up of OCA activities and educational um, offerings. We want to provide an approach to patients and helping them engage and keeping them interested in what's going on. So we developed an active FDA education and advocacy resource. This was designed for patients and by patients. We had patient reps who were on the, um, the testing groups to make sure that the information we were giving was appropriate, that it was easy to use. Um, so how do you get there? So on the, patient, uh, on the FDA site, you'll see on the right-hand side, there's now a for patients section. By clicking that, we'll bring you to our landing page. And on this page, we basically break down so many things for patients. We go all through every single um, center, we go through the Federal Register Notice, and we put it in one area. So the upper right-hand corner is spotlights, which is what's kind of new, what's important for people to know. And then we move down to some of the areas that we have uh, disease-specific pages for. We also have um, all of the meetings, we have all of our listservs over here. Um, some of the other things we have are Submitting, how do, how do you submit comments? Where do you find where patient information is important? So we've created a section that, um, that allows you, with any disease, to find out what, what's important to patients. What I do is every single day go through the Federal Register. I read every single one of them to see, is this important to patients, whether it's HIV or oncology or neurology. And I put, them, I put the information here that's just a little bit of a snapshot to see, hey, I am interested in that, and then provide you a link to regulations.gov where you can make your comment um, immediately. We also help on the very first page give information on how to make a useful comment. We also um, break down all of the FDA public sponsored meetings. So it's not just the advisory committee meetings, it's there's a public workshop for pa uh, uh, patient focused drug development, or there's the medical device labeling meeting coming up. So we have broken down that every month, it, every single day, and um, create it. 
We also wanted to make patients aware of the differences in clinical trials versus medical treatment. So we created a clinical trials page. On this, you can see um, what is an informed consent? What do I need to know? What are the important topics that I should be aware of before signing that informed consent? Diversity. Diversity in clinical trials is a huge thing. And as we saw with Susan Wood, it's very difficult to bring you know, a good, diverse population. And, and it just describes that a little bit more. We also talk what an IRB is, an institutional review board, and a little bit of information on sexual and gender um, minorities. With this page, we created a section where anybody can listen to the webinars that have been provided by the FDA, not just ones that OCA are providing, but also that other divisions are providing. So I've created a page where it gives you, you know, a running tally of since 2009 of all of the um, webinars we have, which I think has been very useful for people because one of the things we want is when you come and talk to us that you have an understanding of the questions and the way that we work. And it just gives you that opportunity to be a little bit more clear with what you want and what you need and what you're asking from us. We've created a page that discusses how devices and drugs are approved. And it goes through the steps of discovery, of research, and breaks it down into simple terms. One thing I will always say is that the FDA site is written for postdoctorate candidates. It's not written in plain language. So one of the goals that we have made is that we have tried to bring that to a patient, to an everyday consumer level. Um, sometimes it's difficult when you're talking about really crazy long words, but we, we do our best in that. Every two weeks, and it just came out a couple of hours ago, we have a patient newsletter. And it does sort of the same thing that I've done on the, the network. It provides, and Deb is one of the co-editors on it, every two weeks we go through everything that's happened in the agency, from approvals to safety alerts to um, uh, drugs that are um, pulled off the market to tobacco. We want to provide everything that you need, just so you have a snapshot of what's going on. It may be important to you, it may not, and it may be something that you didn't know was important. It also discusses, as we said, meetings and uh, drug shortages. So it's a great newsletter that is posted on the web also and sent through a um, listserv. So that is a great tool for people. One of the other things we do is we work with many organizations and create our own meetings. Um, recently, we hosted a webinar with Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy on advisory committee meetings. And I believe that was just posted a couple of days ago. And so it just discusses in general, what do you expect when you go to an advisory committee meeting? What are the rules? What are the processes we need to follow? So we work with many organizations like that. Deb had mentioned um, one of the meetings that we created with uh, JDRF, the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. This brought four of four um, kids from the ages of, I want to say it was 7 to 16, who were on their Congress uh, um, meeting they had and brought them to the FDA where we had Dr. Califf available and Dr. Sharpstein and then Center for Drugs and Center for Biologics. And it was a meeting to hear from the kids and how the devices on the market affect them and how they, you know, oh, I don't want to have a continuously monitoring, monitoring blood glucose system. But then they saw that it changed their life and the things that they look at. So it's a wonderful tool, and I think that the agency really valued hearing from those kids. Typically, we don't. Typically, we hear from a parent in, the, you know, in that sense. And I think there's a lot of other models where we're finding that the caregiver and the, the child's views may differ, and I think those views are important views to see. So we're starting to develop tools to hear both sides of the story. Um, we've had three meetings that we hosted. The first one was talking about benefit risk. That was right before the PDUFA meetings were about to kick off. Um, in 2013, we kind of demystified the FDA. What is the drug development process, the device development process? In last year, we, um, we did under the microscope pediatric drug development. It brought a lot of how can we make more pediatric drugs have indications. And in some other ones, we've worked with um, pediatric cancer advocacy outreach meetings. We've had um, many other meetings, but this was just an example of uh, some of the ones that we have done. You've heard about the patient-focused drug development, so I'm not going to go too much into it. Uh, there are two meetings this coming month on the 22nd and the 29th, and uh, one of them is for Huntington's disease 
and Parkinson's, and then the other one is for alpha one, so I'm not gonna go for it, but it's on the website. They just announced um, the non-tuberculosis uh, infection meeting for October 15th, and there'll be more to come until 2017. These are some of the other patient-focused meetings that are um, coming in the FDA in, in the next three or four weeks. As we said, the medical device labeling, uh, Oh, here it is. It's going to be the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is what I can think of. Um, we also have something about REMS and understanding REMS. Richard was talking a little bit about the, that in his, meet, his presentation. And they are really wanting to see how REMS have impacted patient access. And so a lot, most of these meetings are um, webcast. And most all of these meetings do ask for comments. So if you're not able to participate or you don't want to ask a question at an open public meeting, making a comment on the docket is extremely important, and it's actually really valuable. And if it's done prior to the meeting, or like say it's an advisory committee meeting that you're making, if those comments are made, they are provided to the panel. So when they're reviewing all of their information, they're also reviewing your questions or your comments. So it sometimes can have just as much impact to write a question and submit it through, the reg through regulations.gov as it does to stand up in the room and ask a question. And that is my presentation, and I will ask Deb to come up if anybody has any questions. Anyone? When we had our CMS meeting a year ago, there was a very clear stop and start point from the time when they would speak with us. And it was around the proposed rules, right? Mm -hmm. So when the proposed rules were issued and there was an open comment period, fair game. But once those closed, they wouldn't speak on a particular issue any longer. So when you look at that administrative process, do you have those same rules in terms of timing? When you take feedback to a certain point and then it cuts off, does it open it back up again? Or how does that work with the FDA? There's really no timelines in a sense because we can't talk about any applications in particular because it's considered proprietary information. In fact, we can't even acknowledge that we have an application that's in for an experimental drug um, unless it's publicly discussed already, and it usually is on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so you could come in at any point and talk with us. and. It, this, there's no stop point that, unless, Richard, do you have any further comments? Maybe all three of us should be up here. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but uh, if you're, you're, I think you're talking about the regulatory process and procedures to get things into oh, the books, yeah. right? Yeah. So there are distinct yeah. timelines, and when the FR notice, Federal Register notice comes out, yeah. it'll have, here's the, the comment period is open until... And Steve organizes all of that by when those, those closing dates are for comments. But there are certain things like guidances, even though there's an open comment period, guidances are more flexible. So if people have comments even after the guidance becomes finalized, we still welcome comments mm -hmm. because those really need to live and breathe with the changes in technology and, and the way that people are thinking. So in order to keep those more flexible, those have a little statement at the beginning that even though this is a final guidance, if you have comments about it, they can be submitted and it tells you where you should submit it. So on, on the website, you can see it hard, it's a little hard right there, but I do post the comments are needed by a specific time. Um, but it does state that in the Federal Register, they can be mailed in and they will be given to the division after the closing date, but the consideration or it changing anything probably would be in uh, some other review or something like that, so. But to actually come in and talk with us is any time. So one more. So you talked about um, the number of phone calls that you get from patients. Yes. And caregivers who may, in fact, need some particular level of support. Yes. How can we help you with that and make sure that you can be 
few referrals back to those of us who are sort of experts at that? That's a good question. I hadn't thought about it. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about this offline. I know that not all the groups do this. I mean, maybe I can create a list. I, I have a list of some other things that I've created through the years and uh, have a list so that if they call with a particular issue and it seems like they could gain some benefit in getting some counseling. Yeah, that's a great idea. So, yeah. And then I also want um, just to remind people before we go further, Richard brought some brochures and about the patient rep program and some cards about the network. Where are they? They're on the registration desk out front, so just to let you know that we have those out there for you. So, but yeah, so if any, um, I have some cards with me, but if anyone wants to get in touch with me with that kind of information, stop by. Even if I don't have a card, I can get your email and we can be in contact and set something up. That sounds great. We'll put that, you've got the microphone, so we'll put that on our next steps list. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, that sounds great. That would be, that would actually be really helpful. 